Welcome to This Is My Architecture. I'm Matt from AWS. Today I'm joined by Srini from Philips Healthcare. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me here, Matt. So tell us about Philips Healthcare. What do you do? So Philips Healthcare is a health tech company that focuses on patients, providers, and medical devices across the health continuum. Great. So today we're going to be talking about IoT and serverless and how what this means for Philips and its medical devices. Is yeah. that right? So Philips has a health suite digital platform, which is a cloud-based platform that allows our devices to connect to the cloud. Okay, so what kind of devices are we talking about here? Yes, so these are like clinical devices, like MR machines, imaging solutions, and also on the consumer side, blood pressure machines that are uh, in the hospitals. And these are sending data to AWS for analytics? Like what kind of data is coming yes, out so of it? So we are capturing device diagnostic information so that we can help our healthcare providers to optimize how well the devices are being used. So I see we have two routes into this architecture. It looks like you have AWS IoT and its gateway, but you also have API gateway. Why do you have both here? Yeah. So Philips has been connecting medical devices to internet for over a decade. So it is key for these devices to authenticate our Philips identity access management. So the requests, HTTPS requests that are coming through the API gateway are actually um, evaluated using the custom authorizer Lambda that introspects the tokens, their tokens, with our identity access management. Got it, so these are HTTPS uh, RESTful API requests that go through API Gateway. So why are you using Lambda for this piece here? So one of the key goals for our platform is to scale the platform and as new devices come in, and also for us to not maintain any servers was key. Yeah. Um, in future, you will see how we are leveraging the custom authorizer Lambda for other requests as, as well. Okay, great. I see this design pattern a lot where companies such as Philips and other enterprises have their own identity and access management systems. So in this case, you're using a custom authorizer to interact with, with it, right? And I imagine then you can exchange it for a token, which yeah. you can then use to talk with AWS services. Is that yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. So what happens is the custom authorizer is actually introspecting the token with our identity access management, yeah. which generates the policies which will allow us to either to allow the request or deny the request. And these policies are all based on the permissions that are actually from Philips uh, uh, Identity Access Management. Okay, so you have Philips uh, Identity and Access Management. When you say policies, are those IAM policies? Yes, those AWS are IAM US policies. IAM policies? That is correct, yeah. And so does that allow you to have fine-grained control in terms of what resources uh, yes. each call Yes, so it's a multi-tenant solution, so it is key for us to figure out for which tenant the authorization has to happen for that particular device. Got it, interesting. Okay, so is this, you said it's a multi-tenant environment, so uh, by using this model with the policies and the fine grain access control, you can limit what specific devices or even specific functions on a device can talk to down to say the item level or bucket level, is yes. that right? So the core usage of this platform is for Philips Remote Services, Yeah. and Philips Remote Services, uh, remote engineers should be authorized to only connect to the specific set of devices. So essentially the data that is coming from these Philips devices, either um, through the business Lambda implementation, gets pushed into S3 buckets as a blob data, mm -hmm. or into DynamoDB. And we are, at this point of time, the business Lambda is actually using the policies that have been generated, whether where the data should be going for sister and who should have access to it. And I guess it knows where to go or what to do based on the parameters or even the URL that you pass with the RESTful API call, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Got it. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense on this side. So turning to the other side then, you have AWS IoT. So walk us through how this works. Yes, so as we build upon this platform, one of the key for us is to provide PubSub model, mm -hmm. so MQTT based. Okay. So we are using AWS IoT gateway for us, for our devices to connect into the platform using the MQTT. Okay, so, so MQTT is an encrypted protocol just like HTTPS, so yes. you have that I encrypted data in flight. That is correct, yes. And what is key in that route also for us to use the same identity access management, so there are no certificates here. We are using the new AWS IoT custom authorizer capability where Philips devices use OAuth 2 bearer token mm -hmm. into the AWS IoT gateway which actually um, calls the custom authorizer Lambda. The Lambda introspects with Philips Identity Access Management generating the same policies 
that were previously generated on a HTTPS request. That's interesting. So you're using the new OAuth 2 functionality, but really kind of a similar model at this level with lambdas and a custom authorizer talking to the same identity and access management system. And does it work the same way where it then assumes a policy with find your permissions that allow you to touch yes, a resource? it works the same way, yeah. Okay, very interesting. So you have encryption in flight, you have a serverless model with Lambda functions, an API gateway, and AWS IoT. Now, a AWS IoT is a rich platform. Are you using any other parts of uh, that solution? Yeah. So as the requests come in, as the messages come in through the AWS IoT gateway, we are using the IoT rules engine, mm -hmm. which allows us to actually run write queries on SQL queries on top of the message payload to figure out what exactly has to happen with that particular message. Okay, so whereas with this, when you made a RESTful API call based on the parameters, it would know which business lambda to call or where to go. Yes. In this one, you're actually inspecting the payload and using SQL as part of IoT rules to make that determination. That is correct, yeah. Interesting. Now, I imagine you have a lot of devices, so are you also using the device registry to facilitate that? Yes, so every time a device gets provisioned into Philips Identity Access Management, we also create a thing in the thing registry, mm -hmm. which actually allows us to um, group them using things groups capability. Mm -hmm. And one of the key use cases that I talked about was for the remote engineers to be able to uh, control these devices um, from a remote location. That's great. Well, I really like how this uh, architecture you know, has clearly evolved, and I think you said over a decade that Philips devices have been communicating with the internet. We have multiple sort of routes to AWS resources. But uh, you know, it's still day one. You're moving to a serverless model, but I imagine this is going to continue to evolve in the future. Is that, that right? is correct? Yes, this is still a day one for Philips Health Suite Digital Platform. That's great. It's it's a great, secure, robust, and flexible platform you built here. Yeah. Thanks for sharing it with us. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for watching. This is my architecture. <laughs>